Welcome. My name is Paul Oakes. I'm manager of the advisory services team in the Equality Commission for Northern Ireland. At the current time of uncertainty, employers are beginning to have to consider an issue which is of great concern to them, and that issue is making redundancies amongst their workforce. In this short webinar, I'm going to talk to those of you in this situation about some important matters that you should keep in mind when undertaking redundancies amongst your workforce. Hopefully this will help you to keep on the right side of equality and discrimination law when making these hard decisions. We issued an advice note on this topic on the 2nd of July 2020 and it serves as accompanying notes to this webinar. It can be found on our website. Employers are under a complex set of employment duties relating to redundancy, only some of which come from equality law. Many of the duties are procedural in nature and may involve requirements to consult employees or trade unions in advance, to provide adequate notice and information, to consider redeployment where possible, to provide mechanisms for lodging appeals, and to provide adequate compensation by way of statutory redundancy payments. It is crucial to remember that all of these duties, procedures and rules that apply in normal times continue to apply now. Your first problem will be knowing where to obtain good information and advice on how to get your procedures right from the beginning because that will be key to ensuring that they are right throughout and at the end of the process. For employers in Northern Ireland, as good a place as any to find this information is in the advisory guide issued by the Labour Relations Agency. The agency's contact details are shown on this slide. The agency also recently produced a helpful webinar on the topic, which discusses some coronavirus related issues too, such as on consulting with employees who are on furlough. We strongly recommend that you consult the agency's guide and its webinar before embarking on a redundancy process. The things that we, the Equality Commission, have to say about redundancy are built on that foundation and on a presumption that you will have followed the agency's guidance to begin with. You will note, or will have noted, from the agency's guidance that some key words that are frequently applied to the operation of redundancy procedures and which are at the heart of those that are lawful are fair, objective, unbiased and consistent. These are important principles and making genuine efforts to ensure that they are met will help you to comply with your duties under both the Employment Rights Northern Ireland Order 1996 and the Equality and Discrimination Laws. For example, applying fair procedures consistently between employees of different sexes, religious beliefs, political opinions, racial groups, sexual orientations and ages is the best way to safeguard against allegations of direct discrimination on those particular grounds. However, it is important to remember that you may need to use a more flexible approach on certain occasions, especially in the case of disabled employees or those who are pregnant or on maternity leave, because you are under some additional duties in respect of those particular employees and you may need to treat them more favourably than others to satisfy those duties. I come back to this point shortly. For a redundancy procedure to be fair, good communications and a sharing of information between employers and their employees is needed. It is good practice and in many situations there is a legal duty to consult employees or their trade unions. One aspect of ensuring fairness is the need to ensure that everyone is able to fully participate in these processes. Employers should think about how they communicate with their staff and be prepared to adjust their communication methods to ensure employees understand what's happening. Some examples may be useful to further explain that uh, issue. For example, be prepared to conduct virtual meetings instead of physical ones 
and be flexible when scheduling the times of these to suit employees' caring responsibilities. Secondly, don't communicate solely through normal communication channels, such as workplace emails, if some employees are at home at this time and are unable to access their work emails. If there is an employee who has, for example, a learning disability, be prepared to take extra time and effort to explain the processes and options. This may include visiting the person's home to discuss such matters if that would help, subject to observing relevant social distancing rules and guidelines. It is perhaps in the choice and application of selection criteria where the risk of unlawful discrimination in a redundancy exercise is greatest and where caution is required. Clearly statutory equality factors on grounds such as sex, gender reassignment, religious or similar philosophical belief, political opinion, race, disability, age or sexual orientation should usually be ignored. For doing otherwise may only be be permitted in very rare and exceptional circumstances. For example, it may sometimes be permissible for some employees to argue that a genuine occupational requirement exception applies, which would allow them, for operational reasons and given the nature of the jobs in question, to retain a specified number of employees with certain characteristics, for example, particular religious belief or race or age. In the vast majority of cases, such defences are unlikely to apply. It would be prudent to consult the Equality Commission when considering whether such an exception may apply in any particular case. As the guidance from the Labour Relations Agency and other advisory sources affirm, employers may, and frequently do, use criteria that are based on factors such as attendance or absence levels, timekeeping, job performance and capability, skills, qualifications and experience, behaviour and discipline, and length of service. The list of permissible factors is not necessarily exhaustive, but care is still needed when choosing or applying criteria such as these. I'll discuss some of the risks next. On a general word of advice, when you assess employees against your set redundancy selection criteria, you should, as far as possible, do this objectively and on the basis of good evidence, such as accurate appraisal, timekeeping and attendance records. Such records should be retained so that they might be scrutinised later. In other words, create and keep a paper trail. The value of this will become important later in the event that you are challenged by an aggrieved ex-employee, for it will help you to refute any allegations of discrimination that are made and to lawfully justify the selection decisions you took. When comparing employees for the purpose of making redundancy selection, you will inevitably make those comparisons by reference to a particular period of time, for example, the last 12, or 24 months. The choice of the reference period is largely within your discretion, but some care is needed. Particular dangers may arise in relation to employees who are or have been off work due to pregnancy, maternity leave, or disability related illness. For example, it would be unfair and probably unlawful to compare the job performances of a woman and a man in a particular time period where the man has been able to attend work regularly, but when the woman has been off on maternity leave, or where a pregnant woman's job performance has been adversely affected by morning sickness or other pregnancy-related factors. If possible, make allowances for those circumstances. Assess the woman's job performance in relation to a time period prior to her pregnancy and maternity leave or a disabled person's job performance in relation to periods when they were at work. A separate potential risk about the choice of assessment time period arises out of the coronavirus lockdown itself. In many workplaces, some employees have continued to work 
to the same or a lesser extent as before, whereas some of their co-workers have not been able to do so for coronavirus related reasons, such as their need to comply with government health guidelines or their need to look after children or other dependents. This raises the prospect that some employers, as part of their redundancy selection criteria, may compare the job performances or attendance records of employees during this lockdown period with the result that those who attended or carried out work may be rewarded when their co-workers cannot be. If this happens, there is a danger of unlawful discrimination also occurring, particularly if those who are penalised as a result are off work for reasons over which they have no real control. Example, pregnant women and disabled people. Furthermore, female employees who have been off work due to unavoidable caring responsibilities could be at risk of experiencing indirect sex discrimination. To avoid these risks, it would be prudent for employers not to assess their selection criteria by reference to the coronavirus lockdown period, but to base their assessments on earlier periods, if possible. As I noted previously, there is a general rule that the selection criteria should be applied consistently to all candidates in the pool of employees from which the selection will be made. Yet, there are also certain situations when employers are permitted and indeed obliged to treat some employees differently, even more favourably than others. This is especially relevant where attendance or absence records are used as selection criteria and in those cases where an employee's absences were caused by or were related to pregnancy or maternity or disability. In the case of pregnant employees or those on maternity leave, employers should always ignore any absences that occurred during a protected period and which are pregnancy related. For example, illness caused by pregnancy or maternity leave absence. The protected period is the period from when an employee becomes pregnant up until the end of the statutory maternity leave period. In the case of disabled employees, employers should always keep the reasonable adjustment duty in mind. What is required by the duty depends largely on the facts of each individual case and what is reasonable in that context. But it can certainly be said that there will be situations in which the reasonable adjustment duty might require all or part of a disabled employee's disability related absence records to be ignored for the purposes of a redundancy selection exercise. For example, if the absence has resulted from the employer's own failure to comply with the reasonable adjustment duty, such as where the employer previously failed to provide suitable assistance or equipment that would have enabled the disabled employee to avoid being absent in the first place, then those absences should probably be discounted. In other situations, it may also be reasonable to discount or ignore short-term absences which are infrequent or which are not likely to recur. Employers should take particular care when using length of service as a redundancy selection criteria. Such a criterion is potentially age discriminatory, especially if it is used as the sole selection criteria. For example, last in, first out because it may disproportionately benefit older staff members if they are the longest serving employees. In such situations, its use may have to be objectively justified or it may be unlawful. If, however, length of service is used in conjunction with several other selection criteria, then its potential age discriminatory impact, if any, will be diminished and is likely to be easier to justify. A length of service selection criterion may also have a discriminatory impact on other equality grounds in workplaces 
where an employer that has been taking lawful affirmative or positive action measures to successfully increase the level of representation in the workforce of groups who have been historically underrepresented. Where such a criterion is likely to have a disproportionate impact of this kind, then again it should be able to be objectively justified or should not be used. Do not forget a special duty that employers owe to employees who are on statutory maternity, adoption or shared parental leave at the time their posts are deemed to be redundant. When considering which of their otherwise redundant employees can be redeployed to suitable alternative work, employers are obliged to treat employees who are on these three types of family leave more favourably than others on those occasions. For example, employers are obliged to give those particular employees the first offer of any suitable alternative work that is available. This derives from the regulations that are noted on the slide. I'll finish by discussing some potential age discrimination concerns that may arise after you have selected the employees who will be made redundant. The selected staff will be owed other duties in respect of receiving adequate notice and redundancy payments. Many employers operate redundancy schemes under which such matters are calculated with reference to the employee's ages and or lengths of service. Although such schemes may have age discriminatory impacts, they are not necessarily unlawful so long as certain conditions are satisfied. Firstly, a scheme will be lawful if it strictly follows the statutory redundancy scheme. For further information about the terms of the statutory scheme, we recommend that you consult the Labour Relations Agency. Secondly, if it is an enhanced redundancy scheme, which provides employees with greater notice periods or redundancy payments than those required by the statutory scheme, it will be lawful if it satisfies the conditions laid down in Regulation 35 of the Employment Equality Age Regulations, Northern Ireland 2006. For further information about the details of this, consult our specific guide for employers about the regulations. Thirdly, even if an enhanced redundancy scheme does not satisfy the conditions laid down in Regulation 35, it may still be lawful so long as the employer can objectively justify it. To do this, the employer will have to demonstrate that the scheme is a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. This is the front cover of our guide for employers on the age regulations. The guidance on making lawful enhanced redundancy payments is on page 29. That's the end of the webinar. I hope it has given you some food for thought. Um, before I go, I would like to highlight some of the other services that we provide and which you might find helpful in relation to redundancy, but also other equality issues. Um, firstly, we have an employer training programme, which uh, has recently been promoted uh, for the months of July and September. Um, and you can book places on this by visiting our website. We also have an employer inquiry line, which you can phone on 02890 500 600, where you can receive advice on a range of equality issues. We can also offer the provision of one-to-one -one advice with employers uh, where this is uh, required. We have a host of guidance on a range of equality issues on our website. Um, we also offer good practice videos and a number of podcasts on specific equality issues. These are our contact details. Please don't hesitate to contact us if we can be of further assistance. Thank you.